never, ever for any reason throughout the conversation, give them the opportunity to say the word no. I absolutely love selling cars. I love the transactional aspects of the dealership world. I love the daily negotiation and everything that it involves. Now, of course, there are some pathologies, some negative externalities of the industry. It's hard to take time off. It's hard to manage work-life balance. And it's really hard to make sense of moving up in the world. It's a very strange business world. Regardless, I love car dealerships and I love hearing from all of our viewers that are pursuing their dream car sales jobs or asking for advice on how to sell their own car, how to sell cars in dealerships. And I try as much as I can to answer those questions and those emails and messages, but I don't always have time. So I thought today I would put together a video of some of the tips that I have learned over years and years of selling hundreds and hundreds of cars that might help you be better at selling your car. Now these should work whether you're a career car salesman in the industry or you're just trying to sell your car on Facebook Marketplace. So regardless of what you're trying to do, I hope that this proves helpful. And so I've got five tips that I want you to understand that should hopefully make it a whole lot easier to sell your car and get as much as possible for it. The first thing is to depict the car properly. You wanna take enough pictures to show the condition, show what the car is really about, show what options it has, show it from every angle, but don't over photograph the car. Don't go editing these things in Photoshop, putting the most beautiful image of the car that you can possibly find. It's okay to include one or two of those, but when I see Photoshopped listing photos of cars, I know that I'm not gonna really learn anything about the condition of this car by looking at the listing. I wanna see the car in a well-lit open space in a way that proves that it hasn't sat there for 10 years, but that they're here, they're interested in documenting the car and getting it over the curb. And so along with that, your description needs to be direct to the point, not crafting some beautiful narrative of what it's like to drive this car and what you can imagine and listing all the statistics that they should have found somewhere else. You're there to describe this car against the marketplace, against other examples of the same car that they might see for sale. Tell them what's significant about the car and tell them what is broken about the car. As people approach the pre-owned market for automobiles, they have to use their imaginations a lot. People are scared about buying a bad example of a car and they need you to help them not use their imagination as much as possible. And so what you're gonna wanna do is tell them everything good and very critically, everything bad about a car. Now, as you tell them the bad things about the car, you're gonna exaggerate the significance of the slightly bad things, and you're gonna minimize the significance of the really bad things. So let's say I'm selling a higher mileage Lamborghini Murcielago that has a bunch of rock chips, some wear on the interior, but also a little bit of noise out of the front diff and a really worn clutch. Now, two of those are no big deal for ownership. Two are extremely big deals and they're very expensive. Regardless, I need a buyer to make a decision based on knowing all those things. Otherwise, I run the risk of them suing me later for misrepresenting the car or just getting really, really mad when they learn about an issue. If I tell them up front, they don't get to be mad at me. They might decide they should have looked into things more significantly as they were shopping, but it ain't my fault anymore. So let's say I'm trying to describe that car and I'm gonna say, look, if you're looking for a trailer queen or some garage princess, this car isn't it. It's been driven and the condition is consistent, but maybe a little bit better than it should be for the miles. I've maintained the car well, but there are a lot of rock chips and they are pretty deep. If you want this car to look perfect, plan on some paintwork. It hasn't bothered me, but it is there. And I'm not trying to hide it from you. I'm not gonna go put colored wax in there before you come. I'm gonna make sure that you know that this car is really rock chipped up. There's some scrapes under the bumper. There might be some worn tires and things like that. So don't expect a 5,000 mile car when you come to buy my 40,000 mile car. Also, the interior, they're hard to get in and out of. There is some wear. Most of it was from the people that owned it before me, but there is some wear on the interior. So just come here not expecting perfection, and I believe you're gonna be really happy with the car. Now also, you're, you're aware of how these cars work. This car does have a little bit of a noisier front differential than some of them. I would suggest that you continue to use the same additive that I've used with the diff fluid each time me and my guys service this car. It's gonna make it sound a lot better and last as long as you would need it to. Also, like many used Mercies on the market, it doesn't have an extremely fresh clutch. There is some wear there. I believe it's got plenty of life left. 
we welcome pre-purchase inspections. I spend a lot of time talking about the wear things that don't really matter in terms of the mechanical ownership of the car, and a little bit of time just brushing over the things that might be wrong. Regardless, I'm always crafting it towards it's okay. Whatever you're thinking that you want, this is what this is, and this is what you should want. And what's most important all the time is to be honest. I know people want to paint their cars in the most attractive way possible, but buyers want to know the truth, and they'll pay a lot more if they have to use their imagination less. If you know what Carfax says, know what AutoCheck says, and you present the car in a great way, even if there are issues, they're going to appreciate you for being upfront, and they're going to trust you when it comes to the parts of the transaction where they need to trust you more. Accepting payment, transferring title, taking delivery, not killing you. All these things that you need a buyer to do well, quickly, and easily are all going to go easier if you've been really, really honest in the stuff that they didn't necessarily even expect you to be honest about. The next thing, number two, is document your car. It doesn't matter if you've owned it for a month or 10 years. The way you document your car is the story of the car. That's what this whole channel is about. That is what the VinWiki app is about. We've built a way that you can arrange everything that's happened from what you could learn at Carfax or AutoCheck, what you know from the seller you bought it from, all your DIY maintenance, all your modifications, everything you know about a car's history can be in its VinWiki timeline and profile. And we recommend that you download the app and fill that out. But even if you're just gonna shove a bunch of receipts in a folder and throw it in the glove box, how you present the car's story is the story that they are going to understand and hopefully accept. So be sure to document your car and have your story. That's the third thing. Have a story. Every car has a story. We try to tell as many of them here. But you need to have a story as to why you are selling this car. People assume you're selling it because it's a piece of garbage that you can't deal with anymore. Hopefully that's not the case, but even if it is, let them know they're buying a project. The honesty will pay off in the end. But if it's that your wife is making you sell it, that you just had a kid and you need a back seat, that you're upgrading, that you've owned a bunch of these and you just want to own some more, all of those answers are the answers to the question that most used buyers should be asking early on in the process. Why are you selling this car? And when you answer that, have a good reason. Don't just be like, I'm testing the waters, just wanted to see what it would bring. Nobody expects to get a good deal or have a good buying experience when that is the case. You can tell them, I don't want to sell the car, which is what happens to me a lot. I get people asking, hey, do you want to sell this gun? Do you want to sell the 640? Do you want to sell a cannonball car? No, I don't. I don't plan to. And so if you're going to ask, expect a really stupid number if you insist on making me tell you what it would take to buy it. I may not tell you, but if I do, it won't make sense, and that's your fault for not listening when I said I didn't want to sell it. Now, the next thing that matters, and is very, very critical, is that price. So the fourth thing that you want to do is price the car reasonably. Now, there are many, many schools of thought on price, and they all have their own justification. But the goal is always to get the most for your car, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the way you do that is by starting by figuring it out exactly how much your car should be worth. That means get a real buy figure from a real dealership. That might be as easy as taking it to CarMax. If the car is a little bit more special, I don't recommend that. Regardless, you need to know that CarMax will pay you 10% less than it would bring at a wholesale auction. Now, you may find out what it's worth if you have access to Mannheim's MMR or other auction results and say, look, this is what it would bring in a wholesale circumstance, or these are some retail examples of documented transactions. Now, if it's an auction, let's realize that the seller got 8% less than that in most cases, maybe 10% less. So understand what the fees involved are with any method of sales, but understand also that that's how the process works. If you don't start by really being honest with yourself and knowing what your car is worth, you're gonna keep asking too much. You're not gonna listen to when people tell you it's not worth that. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to take wholesale. You may hear the number and say, you know what? Car dealerships don't actually operate on that profitable a business model. They're probably only gonna end up making three or 4% at the end of the day. I'm gonna save 8% on my sales tax credit by trading it in. I think I'm just gonna let them have it. So you may decide that's where the car's going and there's nothing wrong with that. You also may decide, well, I always have that as a backup plan and that means that that's the easiest deal available so I don't need to take your offer to be exactly that. Now, I have made a lot of offers equal or less than wholesale numbers and convinced people to take them. 
That takes some practice, it is possible, but I'll do another video some other time on how to make the right lowball offer. That's not really what this is designed to be about. Now it's worth noting that professional car salesmen are very, very bad at selling their own cars. And that's for a very obvious reason when you look at the psychology of how a dealership works. In a dealership transaction, you've got a buyer, you've got a salesperson, and you've got management. The salesperson is actually designed to be perceived as an advocate for the buyer. They're the good guy. The bad guy is the management. The salesperson should not know what the minimum price the dealership will take. That's not always the case. You've got plenty of these no-haggle prices where the salespeople don't really do anything. They're just parts in a vending machine. They take the order and they do the delivery. They don't do any negotiation. They don't do anything to build value about the car. They're just there to shake your hand in a normal circumstance and lead you through the process and tell you how the car works on your way out. And they're just there to churn and burn as many cars as they possibly can. Now that's how it should work. When I sell my own car, I don't have a bad guy backing me up. I've got to hold my own gross or I've got to make the most profit, I hope. But in most cases, when you sell a car, like I said, you should know what you will take. And when car salesmen sell their own cars, they know what they'll take and that's what they get. So I always recommend that you actually have somebody else sell your own cars. Uh, you'll get more money for them inevitably and you'll cover whatever that person's gonna charge you. But regardless, if you've made your price clear and it's been priced appropriately within the market, then you're ready to start negotiating. Now that starting point should be consistent with the market. It doesn't need to be outrageous unless there is one specific case where you need to outprice the market every single time. And that is if your car is truly, truly rare. The reason for that is that hopefully they're buying those cars to drive, but inevitably they're buying these cars as an investment. And the way that the internet gets cashed, if you price your car at a, what it's probably worth today with no room for movement, when that person buys the car and goes to sell it in the future, everybody's gonna be able to Google the VIN and see what the car brought previously. It's always been the case for auctions. It's been harder for people to buy a car at an RM Sotheby's auction and then sell it two years later and make money because everybody knows what they paid. Now that doesn't really have anything to do with what the car's worth then. It just gives you more of an uphill battle for negotiation. So if you're going to sell a, a rare car publicly, price it 20 or 30% beyond the market. If they're interested in the car, they're still going to inquire. Let them know what you've done and let them know what you think it's worth and then start the negotiation from there. Now, once the negotiation starts, the goal is to keep them as close as possible. And a lot of people are really bad at that. They're gonna hear a low ball offer and they're gonna get insulted or they're gonna try to stay so close and they're just gonna end up alienating a very committed offer. The currency of a sales process is commitment. So never be afraid of a low ball offer and never be afraid of justifying why you've priced the car the way you have. Committing to both of those ends of the spectrum is what makes the process move along and be successful. So don't be mad if somebody says, I will pay you this today for your car. That's exactly what you want to hear. The whole process is designed to get someone to that point of saying, this is what it'll take for me to buy it today. It may not be what you want to hear, it may not be what you're going to take, but it's at least an invitation to have a real discussion about someone really owning your car. What I suggest, once you have a very justifiable starting point for price, is that you say exactly this. I price the car in line with what I view the market to be based on these factors. I understand that you'll want to pay less and get the best deal possible. I am flexible and I'm willing to negotiate but at this point, my flexibility is on the order of hundreds of dollars rather than thousands of dollars. So please let me know where you need to be and I'll do my best to make that work. That lets them know everything they need to. I've said that thousands and thousands of times and it works extremely well. Some version of I'm flexible but not that flexible is exactly what you want to say. But what you want to say throughout the process is the most critical thing. And that's the fifth thing. Let the buyer talk. Most of the time when a car salesman or someone selling a car gets a lead, they immediately launch into a presentation or a diatribe of the history of the car, of what it is, of why they think you wanna buy it, and they never let the buyer talk. It is the worst thing you can do, it is a huge mistake, and it never ever ends exactly where you want it to. The whole goal of a sales process is to take what someone wants out of a car and what this car is and make those things converge through the process of talking to a prospective buyer. If you do that, you can end up on exactly the same page about what you want them to pay, about how the transaction's gonna function, how it's gonna close, and where you're both gonna end up. 
So what you want to do is let them tell you why they're there. They didn't just stumble in off the street. They didn't just randomly start typing into the internet and wind up emailing you about a car you have for sale. They're there because they believe something about the car and about what the car is going to do for their needs out of an automobile. So let them tell you that. Now, it may be exactly what the car is. It also might not be. Let's say, for example, you're a car salesman at a Lamborghini store. And inevitably, you're going to get people who are cross-shopping the mid-engine V8 Ferrari, the V10 Lamborghini, and the V8 McLaren. They're all similar price points. It's the most competitive space in the supercar market. Now, the Ferrari has the heritage, the racing history. It is quintessentially a sports car. People are going to see it. They're always going to know what it is. The Lamborghini, a little bit more unique, a little bit more outrageous, a little bit more I'm me. The McLaren, the cutting edge of performance and technology, the fastest thing they're capable of producing. Now, each of those cars comes with its liabilities and vulnerabilities. Ferrari, maybe there's a lot of self-indulgent wieners in this town. They all have the same exact car at Starbucks. Maybe they don't have the same build quality they used to, or maybe it's never been that good. Maybe the Audi influence over Lamborghini has watered down the experience and the cars are a little bit too numb. Maybe the McLaren isn't reliable, perhaps, just due to them being on the absolute cutting edge of technology. Now, when someone comes in, they're going to tell you why they think they came to look at the Lamborghini. And you want to hear that. If they say they want everybody in the world to know they've been successful, the Ferrari may be better for that. However, you can educate them about what they will love about a Lamborghini relative to a Ferrari. And if they come to believe what you've told them about it, then it's probably going to be a successful transaction. So don't be afraid for somebody to give you a reason that doesn't make sense. Just use that as an opportunity to let them know why they should be looking for it. How do you do that? you make them say yes. If you're asking someone to buy a car eventually, never, ever for any reason throughout the conversation, give them the opportunity to say the word no. It doesn't matter if it has absolutely nothing to do with the car. Every answer they give you needs to be yes. There's different metrics on the psychology here, but if you get someone who's interested in something you have to sell to tell you the word yes, between 20 and 50 times in a two hour interaction, the likelihood that they'll say yes to absolutely anything you ask is extremely high, sometimes 80, 90%, because they have learned that you guys are on the same page. You're trustworthy. You're doing exactly what they want you to do. It doesn't matter if you just said, hey, can I get you a cup of coffee? Isn't it a beautiful day outside? Isn't it great that the Braves won last night? They're going to say yes to all that stuff, even if they don't care. What you want to make sure of is that every question, every statement that you offer gives them the opportunity to affirm, to agree, to say yes. This is a beautiful color, isn't it? The interior smells great, doesn't it? Everybody knows that you have to love this thing about this car. If you use axiomatic dialogue and you let them know that this is self-evident, this is true, this is unquestionable, then you're going to be moving in an assumptive way towards closing lines, towards commitment, towards them buying your car. If you do those five things, you're going to sell more cars. You're going to get more money for them. And you're going to enjoy the process a lot more. Some people get scared of selling cars, but you should enjoy it. And it can be an awful lot of fun. The craziest thing about selling cars or selling anything is a principle that it usually takes car salesmen years to understand and really grasp. And that is this. The more money you make on someone, the more they pay for something, the happier they will be with it. You think, I need to give them the best deal and they'll love it all the more. That's not true. If someone buys something, it's because they've convinced themselves it's worth what they're going to have to pay. You can do that by giving them such a screaming deal that they can't say no and they'll buy it. But it won't be because they wanted it. It's because they recognized the deal. If they buy it because they recognize that that is what I want, they will love it all the more. So let them talk. Give them enough rope to hang themselves. It's a quintessential line about a sales process. Let them tell you why. Explain to them why they're correct and move them towards commitment. And you'll get enough money to hopefully make you happy. And inevitably, they'll be happier having paid what they decided the car was worth. And they'll enjoy every single mile. So I hope all this proves useful. I know it always has for me. Let me know how it goes as you buy, sell, and own the cars of your dreams. We've always loved Cove for their commuter Bluetooth wireless speakers. They work great and they've continued to improve them even since I got this one, but they also make these awesome Bluetooth 
headphones with noise cancellation and hands-free calling. They sent me this pair to try out and I have to say, I'm pretty impressed with them. I uh, like the way they feel. And if you use the link in the description below, you save almost 70%, which makes them one of the best deals I've ever seen for Bluetooth hands-free calling headphones with noise cancellation. So be sure to check them out. They offer like 12 hours of music or calling and like 200 standby hours or something like that. So a great product from a great company that has supported us over the years. So be sure to thank them for that and check out the link in the description below for a great deal on these Co-Wireless Bluetooth hands-free calling noise canceling headphones.